Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jack, and I would like to welcome you to this Digital Artist Talk. We have over 8,000 students joining us today, which is very exciting. And you are watching us from all over Australia. When I say all over Australia, I mean we have students from every single state and every single territory, which is very, very exciting. And you are all watching us together live right here, right now. So I would like to welcome each and every one of you and a very special welcome to Sean Tan. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us, Sean. Thanks, great to be here. <laughs> and all these students who are watching have sent us videos with questions about them. And we'll watch the questions, we'll hear your answers, and in doing so, we'll learn a little bit about you, your creative process, what it means to be an artist. Mm -hmm. Does that sound good? Yeah. Let's great. jump in. <laughs> great, so we'll go to our first, we're gonna start at the very beginning. A very good place to start. And our first question is a video from Central West Leadership Academy. What inspired you to become an author? Okay, what inspired me to become an author? Um, well, the first thing to say is that everybody already is an author. Um, and as a kid, I, I loved writing and drawing. Uh, I think all kids do. It's just a natural thing. As soon as I could hold a crayon, I was drawing something. Um, I think circles was my, I was very good at circles <laughs> in the beginning. And um, as soon as I could write, I wasn't actually, I was quite late in learning to read, but once I did, um, uh, you know, and could read and write and realise, you know, what you could do with, you know, creating stories, um, yeah, I, I really engaged with it. And also as a kid, I, I made a lot of friends by being able to draw and write quite well. And I was good at telling jokes and stories and you know, making things up. Um, one of the reasons for that is that I was a very small child. Um, I was also the only Asian kid in, in my class in the area where I grew up. And so I was kind of a bit unusual and um, I guess kids didn't know what to make of me. But if I could draw and tell stories, uh, I'd make friends very quickly. And, and that might actually be one reason I became an author and illustrator is that that for me was a way of making friends and um, being socially accepted, but also I really loved it. I mean, who doesn't love writing and drawing or at least listening to stories, looking at pictures, and if you can make them all the better. That's wonderful, thank you. Okay, so now we have a question from St Philomena's School in Moree, New South Wales. Who or what was your biggest inspiration to start writing and why? Okay, well, there's a lot of different sources of inspiration and they come and go, you know. So you, you sort of read something and think, oh, that's amazing, I'd love to do that. I remember reading Dr. Seuss books, for instance, mm -hmm. and I would, uh, I just love the way they rhymed and I love that weird um, floppy fairy world of strange <laughs> things. And uh, and so I, I, I wrote my own Dr. Seuss book, I was probably about eight. Um, it was called The Blue Land of Nu, and, uh, <laughs> um, and it had little pop-ups and things. and. So I, typically what would happen when I was a kid is I would see something I really liked and my reaction has often been, um, at least if it's visual or a, a story, it's like, I want to do something like that. You know, I even remember watching movies, like watching E.T., which was a big movie when I was a kid and thinking, I want to direct a film one day, you know. Um, I want to do that. Uh, so mm. that's, I guess that's what inspiration means. It's when you're so affected by something that you want to do mm. something like that yourself. Um, and I grew up with Star Wars and I was making little, my own version of Star Wars, you know, it was a different world, different storyline, but similar ideas. Um, with writing, I think I only became really quite interested in writing stories around the age of 10, 11. I mean, and that's, a, that's kind of a time when that creativity really kicks in. I think mm. it's a really good time to... Um, to to start doing creative work. And um, I would read some books. Uh, there was one called The Tripod Trilogy by John Christopher, which was a science fiction series. And um, I was very inspired by that. And then I'd write one that was like that. Mm. Um, it's not quite copying, because I wasn't interested in copying stuff. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to do something like that, but in my own way. Mm -hmm. And then later on, um, I discovered a TV show called The Twilight Zone, which was the old 1960s mm. black and white TV show. Very strange, weird stories, sometimes quite frightening and with, um, with unhappy or peculiar endings. And uh, I, I really loved that. That just kind of clicked with me. And so I started to write short stories 
that were in that vein and that led me into science fiction. And I was reading a lot of science fiction short stories and I also came to realise writing, at first it was just a fun thing to do, mm. But as I got older, I realised, oh, you can actually say serious things about the world through writing. And, yeah, when I was younger, that hadn't occurred to me. But when I was, you know, 11 and 12, and certainly as a teenager, I realised, um, hey, art is not just entertainment. It's how we communicate about problems and issues in the world. And build community, no doubt, with what you were saying at the start, when you were little and you would read and write and illustrate and you built social community yeah. and art as a building of community as well yeah uh well the basic impulse doing creative work is like i'm thinking this thing i'm seeing this thing are you seeing what i'm seeing you know it's like if a if a ufo lands in your backyard you don't just pull up a chair and go i'm going to enjoy this <laughs> you you run and grab someone to look at it even if you miss it yourself you'd rather see it with somebody else so it's really trying to just um you know, say, are you seeing what I'm seeing, mm -hmm. you know? Um, are we both seeing this together? And then have a discussion about it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, art is both... I love that it's both very private. You mm -hmm. can do it by yourself, alone, um, but it can also be social because then once you've got it right, you can show mm -hmm. it to somebody and say, what do you think about that? Mm -hmm. And what about when inspiration comes? How do you catch it? What do you do? Do you just let it sit and filter or do you write it down or all manner of ways? Um, well... As a, as a prof I like to think of myself as a professional creative <laughs> now. I, I sort of, you know, I've been working long enough I, that I can call myself that. Um, you do, that is a bit of a trick, is, is trying to remember things. Like if you have a good idea, um, don't trust your brain to remember it. Um, also don't trust your brain to develop it. You need to sort of work it out on, on paper. Mm -hmm. And um, well, I actually have a, uh, I'll just quickly show you. I keep, I carry sketchbooks around. Um, they're all different shapes and sizes, and I draw in them all the time. And if I have an idea, um, I will, I'll sit down and I will um, draw different things. I also, if I see interesting pictures, um, even if something on the internet, um, I'll, I'll cut them out, and uh, and be inspired by them. So I actually actively look for inspiration mm -hmm. all over the place, um, and collect things, mm -hmm. objects. Um, you know, scraps of paper, little notes. Um, I have lists in my iPhone. Like if I think of something, I, I quickly write it down because I'm, I know I'm going to forget it later. And um, later, when I'm stuck for an idea, and you got you know a, a writer's block, which means when you can't think of anything, or artist block, you're staring at a blank canvas and go, I don't know what to paint. I go to my sketchbooks and I on my lists, and I go, Oh yeah, that's right, I remember that. And then I I can start. So um, an idea bank. Yeah, if basically, yeah, like a li personal library of stuff. Wonderful. So maybe you can all get some little scraps of things and tuck them away and keep them for inspiration when you have maybe a bit of writer's block. So we're going to talk about themes in your books. Uh, you have a lot of very strong themes, and I made an attempt, Sean, at trying to summarise summarize most of them, but I'm, I probably have left a lot off. There are many, 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 each very exciting and unique in its own way. But some of the ones we see coming up a lot are colonisation, immigration, history, journeys of life, future and past, loneliness, imagination, friendship and time. I'm wondering if you, Sean, are able to perhaps choose just, I know it's so hard, but just one theme that you enjoy exploring and tell us in a nutshell why you enjoy exploring that theme. Um, yes. Um, it's, it's kind of a bit difficult. All of those themes actually overlap. Uh -huh. So they're often the same thing at the same time. And, you know, where does loneliness and end and history begin? And where does history end and, and some other issue begin? Um, the first thing to say is that I don't pick a theme and, and create work to that theme. And um, I have tried doing that in the past and it's never worked. Mm -hmm. Like when I say, I'm going to, you know, I might be a bit motivated by a particular social issue like, um, you know, say environmental destruction or, or something um, bad that somebody's done. I'm going, I'm going to do a story about that. For some reason, it never works out. The way I come up with stories is I just start with little funny ideas and I just keep thinking about them and then the themes come in afterwards. So I, I don't sometimes even know what the theme is. For instance, with the lost thing, it's just about a boy finding this weird creature on the beach mm. and 
Um, that in itself is nothing. But when he decides, I'm going to take it home and look after it, okay, you got all these problems. And um, the whole time I'm doing it, I'm like, I just love the way this looks and feels, but I don't know what it's about. And then writing and drawing is a way of figuring that out and mm-hmm. and other ideas come in. So then there's a government department that, that sort of looks after things that don't belong, but it's not a very good government department. And um, the parents don't pay any attention to the creature. Why? It just felt right that they wouldn't. And then I thought, well, why? Why can't they see it? What's going on? So... Um, it's a real journey of discovery. Um, but just to get back to your question, mm-hmm. I notice that when I look at all the work together, um, you know, sometimes I'm going through the books and, and looking at my folio and my sketchbooks, I realise that loneliness is a, is a big theme. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure why. One reason might be that when you're a, an artist or a writer, you are working alone mm-hmm. a lot. And... Um, loneliness and sometimes creative depression is is a common side effect of doing this kind of work like if you're you can be really creative and and really buzzing with ideas and then other times you feel um very lonely and depressed and like oh what's the point of all this it's all a bit silly um who wants to read these books that sort of thing these are depressive thoughts every artist i know has has these it's just like normal um i've often used that those feelings as material Mm -hmm. for work so instead of thinking that's the opposite of creative work it's like well like with a book like the red tree why not make a book about that you know yeah and and sort of explore it since it's so familiar to me Mm -hmm. (laughs) the classic rule write about what you know Mm -hmm. um and uh, the other thing is i think there is a lot of loneliness in the world and a lot of things that go unnoticed um i'm also interested in characters that don't have a voice and giving them a voice so there's a lot of people in society that don't have the opportunity to speak or we don't notice for various reasons maybe they're shy maybe they're underprivileged um, maybe they're in a distant war-torn country Mm -hmm. and I'm interested in well let's hear from those people because we don't normally maybe hear from them and uh, yeah and and I think loneliness and isolation is is something we always need to be mindful of um, because it's it's an ever-present issue for everybody both personally and then in a broader social situation and in the same way you say about the ufo landing and saying hey come and watch this with me sometimes it's it's not easy to say hey i feel sad do you feel it too so if you're in a nice little place with a book you can see that the character feels the same way you do and that's a nice safe feeling yeah it's a it's a books are a wonderful world for exploring these issues too Mm. um because it's it's quite private uh, often when you read a book, you're reading it by yourself. You can read it with other people, but there's a special relationship you have with the work. And um, you're also very much involved, especially with a picture book, in creativity, the creative act. So you're at, I like to create books where the reader has to invent the story mm-hmm. and be personally very creative. Um, the book won't make sense unless you participate. And in doing that, I think the reader is having a conversation with themselves and maybe about their own loneliness and it's best to have a conversation with yourself sometimes about those issues um in the same way that when i'm doing the book i'm having a conversation in the creation of the book i'm I'm, yes like a conversation with myself about these Mm. issues and trying to resolve them Um, and then i just pass that that challenge or that invitation over to somebody else great thank you Okay, so we have a question uh, from Macquarie Fields Public School about history and social issues. Okay, why did I choose to write books based on social and historical subjects? Um, It's an interesting question. Um, Sometimes uh, I've not chosen to, but somebody else has suggested an idea and um, at first I, I wasn't sure how to tackle that. So um, one good example is The Rabbits, which is a, it's a book about, um, I'm sure you're familiar with it, it's, it's about colonisation and Australian history. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I first received that text, which was written by somebody else, written by John Marsden, who's a very interesting writer and very established writer, and he'd created a very strange little story, mm-hmm. um, 
at, at first. I wasn't quite sure what to do with it. I could see that it dealt with some social and historical and political issues, and some of them were quite sensitive and with the possibility of even offending some people. Mm. Um, and my task as an illustrator was then to, to think, how can I make this accessible? Because it was dealing with really big issues. Mm. And I had 32 pages <laughs> to, to sort of try and create a world um, that would explain what's going on. And I decided, you know what, I'm not going to explain it. Mm. I'm going to make it even weirder than, than the text. I'm going to create a world where it's almost like you've never seen anything before. Um, all these strange things happen. Some of it is, is magical, some of it's mysterious, and some of it's violent and quite horrifying. Mm. And I'm just going to draw it. Um, as if you're having a dream mm. and um, and then you wake up from the dream at the end and you think, what was that about? I thought, mm. that's how I'm going to approach it. So um, I sort of work in, in, in both ways. Sometimes my stories start with a, a, a dream-like idea and it's, it works its way towards a social or historical issue such as immigration with the arrival. Mm -hmm. The original idea for the book wasn't about immigration. It's about a, a man with a suitcase in a strange place. And then by drawing that over and over again, I realised maybe he's a migrant and then um, I started to do a bit more research and I, I just became very interested as a result of research in um, well, where did my family come from and what was it like for them you know um, and why don't I do some drawings mm. on that subject so that's that's a case where things move towards a certain theme um, in the case of the rabbits, it kind of went the other way, mm -hmm. starting with that theme. And as John Marsden had already done, he'd created, he'd sort of talked about animals arriving in a strange land. I thought, okay, well, I'm going to do something like that and, and see where it goes and just be totally free and open-minded and not thinking about it too much. And, um, yeah, it came up with this really strange book, which mm -hmm. uh, has uh, it's been translated all over the world including in countries where they know nothing about Australian history, but they all understand the story. And um, hugely popular in Mexico, <laughs> um, which is interesting because uh, I think we've got parallel histories okay. about in, uh, I got one group of people invading another place and then having to deal with the, you know, resolving the tensions that, mm. that exist. Wow. That was a great question. Thank you for that question. Uh, so we've talked a little bit about one of the things you're exploring being loneliness. I want to ask you about exploring differences, being the odd one out. So we have one of my favourite characters, Sean, is Eric, the exchange student who lives <laughs> in the pantry, <laughs> and the lost thing, and the cicada, we've mentioned both of those. So not only do we have that experience of being the odd one out in those books with the creatures, but as you mentioned in The Arrival, we have people as really, really old people being in a new place and going through what that's like, really, really young babies being in a new place, going through what's that, what that's like. Across all ages, everyone experiences this. And I want to know, well, I do want to acknowledge that you somehow magically managed to celebrate that and honour and acknowledge how hard that is mm -hmm. to go through. How and why? Why do you explore it? How do you do that? What's that about? It's hmm. a big question. Yeah, that's a really good <laughs> question. Um, like, um, you know, I, I would I would even maybe argue that all stories are about people feeling different. Harry Potter, you know, um, Luke Skywalker in Star Wars. Mm. Um, I don't know, Heidi. Um, the Pippi, Pippi Longstocking, Longstocking. <laughs> <laughs> all these stories are like um, about people who are fundamentally different and uh, that's exciting, you know, um, but it's also very troubling. And if you are, if you are interested in, in being a writer and artist, one thing that's good to know is that um, stories come from problems. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you, if you want a good story, mm. you set up a problem straight away and I can't think of any more common a problem than, than feeling that you're different from everybody else and and not knowing what to make of it. And the truth is that, that that's what makes us interesting as people, mm -hmm. is that we're all really different. But there's a lot of pressure in society to um, be cool, um, to be popular, to be the same, to be successful, all these ideas of what it is to be a good person. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm sort of interested in... in uh, the fact that uh, being a good person means being super unique, you know, mm -hmm. and being really different, um, because that's that's the one resource that you can offer that other people can't offer is your own weirdness, you know. And I've made a career out of it, I guess, <laughs> is like saying I can I can think of some weird stuff which, in 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 other situations, could be actually quite embarrassing, but 
maybe I can I can do something with that, and if I can work it into a story and um, in a way that might be appealing for other people also, then then that would be uh, interesting, you know. Mm. Um, and um, I think the other thing as a theme that interests me is the idea of being honest um, about your own nature instead of trying to be something all mm. the time, to just sort of say, hey, I'm a... I'm a far, small foreign exchange student that looks like a burnt leaf, like in the case of Eric, and, and that's just how it is, and let's just, you know, I won't try and be anything else. I'll just do things my own way and hope that other people respect me for that rather than respect me for trying to be something that they want. Mm. And I, I guess it's why do I do these stories? Um, as a young person, as I'm sure you all know, uh, that you just have a lot of feelings of self-doubt and um, a lot of your difficulties are about, you know, feeling isolated or the risk of being isolated. Um, and I don't know, it's, it's just a theme. If you look at all your favourite movies and stories, you'll see this theme again mm -hmm. and again um, because it never goes away. It's, it's something that all through life there's this question of identity and who you are and where you belong. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, it's, it's something that... Uh, also, the act of writing and painting is almost perfectly set up to explore those ideas. Mm. Sitting down alone in a room and having a having a think about where you belong, you know, so it's a, quite a good exercise. <laughs> okay, so we have some questions about your creative process now. Uh, we talked about the themes in an art. Uh, we've got a question f from Lansdale Public School about the time it takes to write a book. How long does it take you to finish writing a whole book? A whole okay. book. Yeah, a whole book. Oof. Um Well, I should break it down. I say to do say to paint one picture. It takes me about a week, which okay. is pretty good. Um, it can be anywhere from three days to a month, but a week is about is about right. And that's when I was about, you know, in primary school, I would have thought that's crazy. You know, spending a whole week on one picture. And I, I wouldn't have had the patience for it. Um, the most I would spend, uh, you know, when I was, say, 10, 11, 12, was about one day. That's a long time to spend on one picture. Um, but basically it doesn't really matter. For me, um, the longest I've spent on a book is five years, which was The Arrival, and that's just because it was such a... It's got so many pages and so many things that I had to draw, and drawing is very slow, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay? Writing can be actually quite quick. If you've got a lot of ideas and you can type reasonably fast, you can write them out. But um, I can just say, you know... Um, there was a tiger in the jungle. That's easy. Mm. Now, to draw a picture of that, I'm going to have to go away for a few hours. <laughs> and, um, for a week. <laughs> yeah, so being an illustrator, it's a, it's a very slow way of telling a story and um, it requires a great deal of patience. Um, the good news is that over the years, I've become more and more patient. So I used to only be able to sit down and draw for about an hour at a time um, and then I get sick of it. Now I, I can draw all day. I don't, you know, I don't get sick of it. Um, that's just practice. Um, the quickest book I've ever done, none of them are quick. The lost thing was pretty quick because I was so unemployed I didn't have anything else to do. But that, took, that took me a whole year. And I know because right. I started it on the kitchen table. It was a really hot, sweltering day and son, I was like, oh, what do I do? i got no jobs. Um, I'll just write a story about a weird creature on a beach and uh, send it to the publisher and see if they, if they go for it. And... Um, and then I really got into it, and uh, I finished it the following January. When know. it was sweltering, yeah, another again. hot day, and um, that's why the book looks like it's always a hot day. Yeah, <laughs> it's steaming hot. <laughs> Great. Okay, we have another question about the creative process, and this one comes from Scotch Oakburn. Um, my question for you is: I find it hard to um, transfer my ideas and thoughts into words sometimes, or even into pictures. Do you have the same problem? And if you do, how do you cope with this? Yes, so I would say I certainly have the same problem um, and, and every creative person, that is the problem of being a creative person is I have an idea. How can I get it out in the world so that other people can see it? How can I make that UFO land in the backyard mm -hmm. rather than just thinking about it? Um, well, there's a, there's a few different ways to answer that question. Um, firstly, uh, the boring answer is just hours and hours of practice. <laughs> you know, if you want to learn to draw a horse, you've got to draw about 500 horses and then you'll become pretty good at it. But that, that's a lot of paper and pencils and hours. 
Um, I remember reading that you, you need to spend, uh, if you spend 10,000 hours on a thing, you become really good at it. I don't think you have to spend quite that amount of time. I reckon 5,000 hours, but that's still a long time if you break it down mm -hmm. into days. Um, so first of all, having those technical skills. Mm -hmm. okay. And it's the same with playing a musical instrument. You want to get to the point where you know the instrument so well, you don't have to think about playing it. Mm. You can just focus on the, on the emotion or the idea and, and your body just does it automatically. It's not that simple even when you're experienced and you're well-practiced. Um, and I find that even now, I have an idea, and, and usually it's not very clear, but sometimes it is, and I just go, oh, this will look great. I want to paint it exactly like it is in my head. It never comes out that way. <laughs> I just can't do it. And, um, but I've learned not to worry about that. I let it change. And the process of painting and drawing and writing is not... People often make the mistake of thinking, you think something first and then you draw it. No, okay. no, it's, it's like the drawing is the thinking. So as you're, as you're drawing something, you draw something, you might erase it, draw it differently. You know, maybe that bird would look better as a lizard. And, you know, what if it's doing this? What if it's, you know, well, make it running? And, and what's it running from? And I'll do a dark shadow over here. Well, that looks kind of like a cloud. And, and it's, there's a storm. And, and then ideas just wow. come. And before you know it, um, you, you're in a place that you, you didn't think of before. And, mm. um, and I've learned to trust that process. Like, just believe that something good is going to happen if I just keep muddling along and, and don't try and control it too much. Mm -hmm. The moment when I start going, no, this story's not going in the right direction and it needs to be important, it needs to be good, then the whole thing breaks down. It's got to be... It's really difficult, but it has to be really playful all the time. And uh, the good thing about writing and drawing is no one's watching you while you mm -hmm. do it. So I do... Uh, lots and lots of little drawings. I write lots of different things in a sketchbook and um, then I go through and I pick out the good bits. Mm -hmm. um, and it's usually, I would say, rule of thumb, it's about 10% okay. over the stuff that I do I think is really good. Okay. And I take that 10% and I develop it more. And then I take a 10% of that, take it over uh -huh. here, develop it more. And so you're constantly growing, like growing vegetables in a garden and getting them juicier and more colourful and um, there's a lot of revision and, and so on. But... Uh, yeah, the original idea is often very different from the final idea, and the final idea is usually better. Hmm. And trusting that process, as you say, don't yeah. try and lock it in, just just get going. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And we know a big part of the creative process journey is arguably towards the end, although it's never finished, when you make that work and then it's time to release that into the world, which can be very frightening. But releasing it out there gives it into the minds of many, many people, each of whom will hopefully have a different interpretation. And so I would like to know from you if there's, I'm sure there's been many, but if you could choose one thing that a reader or reader's experiences of your art have shared with you that, that has surprised you. You never thought when you released that art out there, wow, I never thought a person would feel X, Y, Z. Yeah, um, all the time. And, and that's something that's just like really surprised me. Um, growing up as an as an artist is how everybody sees things really differently um when i was younger i thought you've got a message and an idea and you're trying to deliver that okay. in a way that people understand um almost like a preacher giving a sermon i've got something to say i know what it is you need to know it too <laughs> um, i'm going to impart the information to you mm. and um I've, I've come to realise more and more just from people's reactions, they're not even seeing the same thing I'm seeing, but they're often getting the same emotional um, feeling. Okay. But the way that they think about it is differently. And it's because everyone's different. You might come from a different cultural background. Um, you might be a different um, sex, like male or female. That'll affect mm -hmm. how, you, how you look at characters in a story. You might have brothers and sisters. You might be a child. You might be an adult. Um, you might have experienced traumatic things. You might not have. And... Um, so different people react to things in different ways. And probably the book that's created the most diverse range of reactions is The Red Tree. And um, mainly because there's almost nothing in the book. It's just a series of weird pictures. Um, they're not explained. Um, and it shows this sort of quite terrible things happening. But they're, they're kind of funny, dreamlike, terrible. So not, not really disturbing, just kind of a bit unsettling. And so many different people have interpreted those images in different ways and, and told me about their personal stories um, and what this, this image reminds me of the time that this happened to me. 
Um, and some people have said that it's actually um, saved their lives, like at book signings they've come up to me and said this, they couldn't explain how, but they said that the book has saved their life. Um, maybe they were so depressed um, that they thought there was no point in living and then they, they read the book. The book doesn't actually, it's not meant to be therapeutic. That was a real surprise. Also a number of psychiatrists were using the book and they wrote to me and, and I was selling quite a few books <laughs> in stacks to um, psychologists, psychiatrists and also some nurses in, um, in a hospital in Sydney who were using it with um, the families of uh, people with terminal cancer. Um, just to what how I think the books are used in that case is um, because the books don't really say anything and there's a lot of room for the reader to to just interpret a picture and talk about it. Mm. People are able to talk about feelings that are hard to talk about if somebody says just says tell me how you feel. I mean that's quite a hard thing to do. Yeah. But if you've got a a weird picture in front of you, you know, as a little girl in a boat and this stormy sea, um, sometimes. A, a patient or just anybody can just look at that and say, I really relate to this image and it reminds me of this and it, it, may, it, it I feel this and this. And then it starts a conversation. So a book is just the beginning of a conversation, but it's up to readers and other people to, to finish that off. And if it is only inside someone's head and you say, tell me how you feel, that, that can be really overwhelming. But as you say, if it's already out there, if it's already a visual thing that they can point to and yeah, that leapfrogs yeah. them into... Because you're talking about something else. Yeah. You know, it's, it's much easier to talk about something else than to have to talk about yourself. And I think that's the beauty of all books and, and paintings is you've got something over there that, is, that you're putting yourself into when you talk about. Mm. Um, but it feels, again, it's a safe environment and it's fun, you know. It actually becomes a fun thing to do. And shared. No yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I just want to know some, have some questions about the images in your work. We know some of your influences are the contemporary Australian artists like Jeffrey Smart, John Black, Edward Hopper. And you create images that are often very dreamlike and there's a word that we know called surrealism. So I want to know two things. One, if, if possible in a sentence, you, if anyone's watching and you've never heard that word surrealism, if you wouldn't mind defining that, and telling us what it is about surrealism that you like, why, why do you use it? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, surrealism, um, the short answer is surrealism is basically weirdness. Um, often it refers to art that's a bit dreamlike. Mm -hmm. uh, so things are very clear. You know, there's, there's objects and landscapes, but they're, they're more from the world of dreams than reality. And it's a very fun place to work in because, of course, it opens the possibilities to anything, you know. Mm. Um, and uh, another word that's used often is the subconscious. So instead of the thoughts that you have, you know, you hear the voice in your head that's making thoughts, it's the stuff that's beneath that. It's like other ideas and feelings that sometimes are pretty hidden inside of you and they might come out in different ways. Um, you know, they can come out when you're playing a game. Um, they can come out when you're um, singing or doing, doing something that's a little bit different to what you would normally do. And for me, right, it's with writing and drawing, a lot of those ideas come out. Um, it's also a great way of communicating with other people to, to sort of imagine that a story is a dream because um, everybody has dreams mm -hmm. and we, we all kind of know what they are. In fact, they, they may be the first kind of fiction that we ever experience, mm -hmm. like fictional story is dreams and um, where something's happening that sort of makes sense but it's not real. Mm -hmm. and. I don't actually use, a lot of people think I use dreams as inspiration mm. for my work, but I don't because I just don't remember them. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I did, but I don't remember them. But I like the feeling of when I'm doing a painting, it's like this feels like a dream in that it's kind of real and I believe what's, I really believe for a moment what's happening in the picture mm. and that helps me to paint it. It's just I believe that there are these creatures here, weird mm. landscapes. Um, but that it's, uh, I, I think there's a deeper like emotional mm. truth there. And, and there are often things that are hard to explain in words. That's what I like about pictures. You can paint a picture of something, it's very difficult to, I wouldn't be able to find the right words for it. Um, and it's a certain kind of feeling and particularly feelings of weirdness. And I don't know about, you know, everybody watching, but um, I, uh, I, I feel feeling, I feel that I'm weird all the time. Me too. I feel that the world is weird, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's not just me, it's everybody else and the world. Yeah. And um, <laughs> I think nor 
normal things, that's an illusion. Yeah. The, the, the idea that everything's normal, you're just forgetting how weird it is, you know? Yeah. When you sit down and start drawing anything, even the most ordinary object, like an apple or a glass of water, you start going, man, that's weird. That's a weird thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Words. Words. Weird. Say them over and over again. <laughs> weird. Well, that's my next question is about words. Actually, we have wor- question, a few questions about the words that you do or don't write. You've mentioned sometimes there's an absence of words or very minimal words. So the first question about words comes to us from Macquarie Fields Public School. Actually, I'll go to my question first and then we might throw to their video. I have a question about words. One of my favourite books, I can't choose a favourite, but I love Sakata talk and the hieroglyphics in the arrival I want to know how why you have these made up words and languages or not and how do you decide on the sounds mm. huge question Sean yeah <laughs> um, the made up words um, well it's always fun mm. um, got to remember all words once upon a time were made up hey, that's true <laughs> I've never thought of it think that's about weird it. think about it you know <laughs> Um, someone said, I'm going to call that a cow. Yeah. And then other person probably laughed and said, that sounds stupid. And then they, everyone started using it and then <laughs> it started to become normal. Um, and I love reminding myself that language is made up. And, um, and, and then uh, I've always loved stories where people have imaginary words like Dr. Seuss stories or, um, mm. you know, even, even other, other books, you know, like science fiction books where there's alien languages and... Um, the Hobbit, where people are speaking in Elvish and so on. Um, it's just a reminder of how many possible worlds there can be. Yeah. And um, I like having words and also visual images um, that they're like symbols, but they haven't had anything attached to them. Okay. So, um, for instance, uh, the tock, tock, tock sound that the cicada makes, we don't know what that is. And so I like that everybody's guessing including me like what's that sound what's he saying you know uh, is it is he saying something or, or what's going on um a visual example is the red leaf in the red tree like every picture has a little red leaf in it and i like the red leaf because um it's not a symbol that necessarily means something already mm-hmm. i'm always looking for little images that don't have a a meaning like if you had a four leaf clover you can't use that because uh-huh. it's got a meaning already if you have a love heart you know can't that. use that. Mm. Even a flower is, is a little bit suggestive. It's like people have already added meanings to certain objects. So I'm always... A cicada is a good one because I haven't really read that many stories about that particular insect. And so it's a, it's a good... Um, I would call it an open symbol. Mm-hmm. It's a symbol for something, but we don't know what. And um, words can be the same thing. And sometimes you can have a whole book like The Arrival. It's just full of... There's no words at all and it's just... Um, symbols but we don't know what they mean and and I think we're really hung up on meaning mm. to be honest like um, people ask too often what does that mean forget about it yeah, you know just yeah, just, just like <laughs> just look at it and think well oh you know how does it make you feel like mm. think about it more emotionally first instead of wanting to have an answer all the time and in something like the red tree as you say it has so few words and and that has had one of the biggest most diverse reactions because you've given that gift of Make with it what you will. Yeah, I'm not and I, dictate. that's right. And I've, yeah, as I was saying over the years, I realise more and more that an artist doesn't tell people what to think. An artist just gives them the space to mm-hmm. think their own thing. And um, you step back a little bit away from the story. So I don't, I don't feel like I own any of those stories. They're not really mine. Mm-hmm. I just try and put things together so that they're working. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, building a little robot and then once it starts walking by itself it's like I'm done you know it just goes off and, and <laughs> whatever happens happens um, and yeah the book the book works because it can be interpreted in different ways mm. and sometimes your books don't stay as books they change into other things so you've had stage productions of things like mm. the red tree and the rabbits and one of your books the last the last thing became a movie we have a question from Central West Leadership Academy about The Lost Thing becoming a movie. Did you ever expect The Lost Thing to become a movie? Um, yeah, did I expect it? I thought about it. I thought about it, but um, I, I expect very few. I've learned to expect very few things. Um, <laughs> then you're rarely disappointed. Um, but I, I thought about it because The Lost Thing, when I when I 
worked on that book. For a start, when you're, you choose to work in a particular medium, that is materials that you use or that are available for you to use, um, you're quite limited mm -hmm. always. Say if you're a musician, it's hard to sort of show a visual thing. Okay. If you're a if you're an illustrator, it's hard to show movement, you know, because I, I my pictures are very still, you yeah. know, the medium is still and frozen. So you're showing a frozen world. And um, when I was doing the lost thing, most of that it's it is about a frozen world. It's about a world where nothing really changes, where people are caught in this this city where um, they, they just become terminally boring and, and nothing can change and everything is static. It's like the weather is always the same, the lighting is the same. And um, I did sort of, when the creature came into the story, I thought, oh, it's so good to see it move, you know? Mm. And I could suggest it a little bit, like you can see its tentacles sort of, if you, if you draw them a certain way, you can imply motion. Um, you know, where boys throwing Christmas decorations into its open organs. You know, you can sort of show things happening, but um, you can't really uh, realise that motion. Mm. And the other thing is sound as an illustrator. Oh. Even as a writer, maybe you, got, you can sort of suggest sounds, but you can't actually make sounds that people can hear. So the idea for turning it into a film actually came from a, um, a film production company. They contacted me because oh. they'd seen my book at a, a book fair in Italy, um, and it was a British production company originally. And they said, are you interested in turning this into the film? And I said, well, actually, yeah, kind of, because I always imagined, um, you know, I knew what sounds the creature made. Mm. Um, I mean, I leave it to the audience to decide, but I've got my own ideas. And, uh, and the, the atmosphere and all these things, I've been thinking about, I'd, I'd lived with this world for a whole year, so mm. I kind of like really, I really loved it. And... Um, we did a few little tests. I worked with um, other digital artists because I, I actually don't know how to do many things. I know how to paint and draw <laughs> and write. That's about it. And technically, I'm not very skilled and I don't actually have any formal technical training in illustration. I've just learnt by looking at things and, and doing them and doing art classes at high school and so on. Um, so computer animation is a real mystery to me, mm. even now. But um, fortunately, I was working with some extremely talented artists who work mm. in digital media and we were able to work together. And so the, the resulting film is, um, it's a lot of people's ideas, it's not just mine. And I think it's a better product because of that, you know, that they brought their own expertise and ideas about how the lost thing would move, kind of a bit like an elephant and um, the sounds it would make. That's, you know, Foley and sound artists who mm. use different objects to make noises that they record and then you put over the film and it has this magical effect of bringing it to life. Um, so yeah, it was a, a fascinating process. To um, get all the imagination. But long, it was 10 years from the first conception That's to completion. That's probably older than a lot of you watching today. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> 10 yeah. years. Yeah. So I started, started working on that when before you were born. <laughs> <laughs> but having all those imaginations come together to create something would take a long time. Everyone would have such yeah, interesting it's, it's ideas. Yeah, very slow. Skills. Patience is the big thing with, with creative work, just being really patient. And also doing things over and over again, mm -hmm. which can actually drive some people crazy. I just have a certain personality type where I like doing that. <laughs> um, so it works for me, like drawing the same thing over and over and over again until I get it right. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, I've been lucky to meet other people who have a similar um, illness, <laughs> <laughs> that they like to draw things and, and, yeah. and work on things until we get it right. Um, but yeah, once, once it comes together, it's very magical. And you don't yeah. see any of the difficulties. Um, all you have is a, and it's the closest thing to a, a real dream is, is, a, is a nice short film set in an imaginary world. Well, we do have a little clip of The Lost Thing for you to watch, so we'll watch that right now.
you go. You got to see a little bit of a snippet of the lost thing that Sean was talking about. And the lost thing, actually, we touched on at the beginning, won you a very big award called an Academy Award. I would like to know a little bit about what that was like, getting that award from the time you were nominated through to standing up on that stage, accepting that big award in front of all those people. What was that experience from like? From Justin Timberlake. From yeah. Justin Timberlake. <laughs> actually, yeah, of course, from Justin Timberlake and Mila Kunis. He had, to, cool. he had to shake my incredibly sweaty hand. <laughs> I was so nervous. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, that's the main thing I remember about it is nerve-wracking because yeah. um, as a, <laughs> I'm, I'm quite a shy person, you know. I, I'm not extroverted. That's why I like writing and drawing because I can talk to people without having to meet them. <laughs> um, so it's quite an interesting thing to then go into the film world and it's a very social medium, you know, and before that going to screenings. Mm -hmm. That was the first time I'd seen my work projected on the screen and hearing people react to it wow. as it's happening. Um, so it's very much about audience reactions and... Um, you know, like a social environment. And then the, the whole Oscar event, it was a bit strange. Um, the good thing was that we were a team. So okay. it wasn't me winning an Oscar, it was our film. And so we were there as a team and I was just representing the team. Mm -hmm. So that was really nice. And also representing Australia, you know, and um, representing, you know, Perth and Melbourne, which are the two places where the film was made. Um, and actually, the film was made in like really small studios, so with very few people. And so it was kind of, we were very proud that we had made a, we thought, what we thought was a good film. Mm. That said, the first two film festivals we entered it into, it was rejected. So um, that was really disappointing. We thought, oh, we're deluded. Nobody wow. likes our film. So it was really strange to then, people gradually liked it more and more. And then... Um, you know, it was long listed for an Oscar. There's a lot of films considered. And then they cut that list and we're still on. And then they cut it to nominations and we're still on. And realised, well, I guess we better go to LA, you know, just <laughs> in case. Suit. Yeah, first time I've worn tuxedo since um, high school ball. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, we all, all went over there. And we were kind of joking about it because we thought, it was just such, we're up against Pixar and these other big studios with huge production teams. And... Um, I remember when they said, you know, um, and the winner is the lost thing. I, I just, my first thought is, this is ridiculous. This has gone too far. <laughs> <laughs> so from drawing with this hand to sweaty, shaking just a Yeah, hands. yeah. And then it was just like, I just trying to um, represent the, the filmmakers, you mm -hmm. know, and just to really um, make sure that they got the due credit yeah. and everything. So, um, which is quite nerve wracking. Go remember all those names all and them. everything. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was really interesting, but really the best thing about it was meeting the other filmmakers there. Mm. And they were, it was a very warm, friendly environment, I have to say, going to the Oscars. I didn't mm. expect it. Um, very funny. Um, just people, a lot of people there who love film. They're all film nerds, I realise, people who turn up at the Oscars. And <laughs> um, yeah, just had a good time chatting with them. Meeting the other animators, you know. Mm. Also other quite shy people who love drawing and writing and... Yeah, that's one of the best things, actually, I would say about being an artist and following my um, my passions is I, I've, I've met other people who were just like me, which I never realised those people existed when I was a kid. I was thought, I guess I'm the only one who, who likes these weird things. And um, and now I realise there's dozens there's of us. So there's many. dozens. <laughs> um, Everyone's weird. Yeah. We tell, I've said that before. No one's normal. No. Yeah, yeah. no, we're all weird. <laughs> just don't want to admit it. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we only have time for a couple of more questions. So uh, I do have a question uh, from uh, Greenacre Public School about just one last question about your career, something tough about your career. So let's hear from Greenacre Public School. Hi, my name is Marty and I'm from Greenacre Public School. And my question is, have you had any career setbacks? Uh, yes, I have had career setbacks. Um, it, it's pretty... You don't have a career if you haven't had career setbacks um, and hopefully they, they make you stronger rather than making you weaker. Um, I, I guess, uh, you know, I've had a lot of work rejected. That's the first thing to say. Um, you know, when, you, when you're a writer and an illustrator, you're kind of not employed by anybody. You just make stuff, you send it out and you hope that publishers will like it. And in the, the early part of my career was very hard. Um, I was actually just as good a, a drawer and writer as I am now, I mm. think. But it was it was very difficult to get people to understand the kind of worlds that I was interested in creating. 
Um, my solution is basically just to keep doing it and, um, and also talk to people who had experienced similar issues and um, were like-minded and, and be part of a community. So early on I was, I was part of a small Australian community of science fiction writers and illustrators and um, I think we really supported each other. Mm. Uh, and I actually had my first work published in, in little magazines that we did. And so I started very small mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and I haven't had big setbacks, but there's been lots of little ones and it's just mm -hmm. like little highlights, little setbacks, highlight setback, highlight setback, you just keep doing it. Um, yeah, um, the biggest setback always is self-doubt. Um, when you're a creative person, you always, uh, if you're sensitive, you will feel depressed about your work quite often and... Um, even when it's actually really good, you, you still feel it's bad. It's just something that happens. And a lot of people stop making art because mm -hmm. of that. They say, I can't, I'm no good. I'm not an artist. This person's so much better than me. I can't do it. Mm. Well, they, you know, those people then don't become artists. It's as simple as that. So the people who succeed are the ones who just keep going, you know, mm. basically. Great. Keep going. If you are thinking of being an artist, like Sean said at the start, just get going, number yeah, one. Yeah, it's not always fun. <laughs> if you can keep doing it when it stops being fun, then you're a real artist. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do have one lucky last question to sign us off. It's from Lansvale Public School about a bit of advice. We'll go to that video now. How do you deal with criticism? Ah, uh, yes, criticism. Um, first thing, I, how main way I deal with criticism is I, I go out of my way to avoid it. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, when I'm working on something, like privately, like in my sketchbooks and developing a... A book and I draw it many many times I don't show many people you know I will maybe show my editor who's someone I trust that works at the publishing company um, I'll maybe show my wife who's, who's also an artist and whose judgment I trust and maybe I'll show you know one or two other friends I'm very careful about what I show to people because um, I want to make up my mind first you know mm -hmm. I want to decide what's good and bad before other people do that and once mm -hmm. I've worked on something for long enough. I've actually already made those decisions. Like I know it's not perfect. Mm. I know which bits are good and which bits are, are not so good. And um, when it goes out and some people, you know, and I've had pretty bad criticism of my work, I don't care that much anymore because I'm already happy with it. So um, the other thing is, is always think about who is the person doing the criticism because often those people are lousy, lousy artists, I have to say. Mm. <laughs> I always say, you know, you go and do something then, mm. you know, if, you, if you're if mm. you criticising one, you do something better then. Um, mm. And maybe sometimes they do and I fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think it's very easy to, especially in the internet age, it's very easy for people to flippantly yeah. criticise um, something and um, without giving reasons, that's the worst, when they just mm. say, I don't like it. But why? <laughs> you yeah, need yeah, you always got to give reasons. But you, I mean, some criticism is useful, but it's got to be from a trusted person, mm -hmm. like a teacher who you really trust, a parent that you know you really trust, and, and parents' opinions aren't always that good, you know, because they sometimes they say things are too nice when they're not actually. Mm -hmm. So, um, or a friend, you know, some friend who really understands understands you and. Um, mm. Well, very, very quickly, as our last little thing that I would like to ask you, we only have the tiniest bit of time. If you had one piece of advice for those watching today, what would that be? One piece of advice. Well, some of you may want to become artists and writers and you're probably watching really interestingly, you know, what do I have to do? Um, it's so different for every person. Um, the world is always changing. So, you know, when I started working, there were no computers, you know, so everything's different now and I've had to learn and, and adapt. Um, the main thing is to be open-minded, to just be adaptable. Know that, th that your work is going to change, you, you are going to change, your ideas are going to change. Um, and basically, uh, to be persistent. And I guess um, you may not remember much from what I'm saying today, but if there's one thing I... Well, two things I'd like you to remember. Firstly, if you start something, try and finish it. That, that'll really help you a lot in, in learning how to do things. It actually finish your painting, your drawing, your story. Just finish it. Um, and that's what's got me through a lot of things. And the second thing is expect to be depressed about your own work. I think so many of um, my friends in high school who were really talented artists, they stopped being artists because they believed that their work was no good 
they didn't give it time to develop. It's got to have time to develop and um, and expect to be disappointed by what you do. Once you expect it and you know it's normal to be disappointed by by bad art that you do, then you just keep going and doing more good art. Mm. So you know, um, I think that's that's the best bit of advice I can give that would would help a a potential young artist. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We've had such a wonderful time. We've learned such a great deal about Sean, about his career from the start to now. And especially importantly, we've learned different ways we can each be artists in our own way, which is so, so important. So thank you very much to Sean for joining us today. Thank you. I'm sure everyone is clapping very loudly. (laughs) The whole country is probably shaking. And thank you, each and every one of you who's joined us today. We hope you've had a really lovely time. And get drawing, get painting, finish them, listen to Sean, and we'll see you next time. (laughs) Keep reading. (laughs) Keep reading. (laughs) Thank you.